So I'll very briefly introduce Ashish. Uh, Ashish Chandurkar is counselor, uh, permanent mission of India to the WTO in Geneva. And Ashish is somebody whom many of us here on the call would know. Uh, he's someone who has worked uh, in India for long. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's been a Punekar, we would say. People from Indore might take objection to that, but we'll leave that for another day. And uh, uh, Ashish worked in uh, at very senior roles in corporate India. He also wrote extensively in national media about many public policy matters. And before that, he's a postgraduate MBA from uh, IIM Calcutta. So for between uh, Pune and any other city, he loves Pune the most. So, so just that's for another discussion with Indori people later. But I'll hold it there and I'm going to hand it over to Ashish because we're very keen to understand Ashish, what WTO is, what does it do, uh, what are India's interests out there, what have we been able to achieve so far, what did we achieve in the latest deal that happened, what are the implications of that for, uh, for people at large. A, at a macro level to big corporates, but also for MSMEs and people at large in India. Uh, so very keen to hear all of that. And it'll be interesting to hear how did the negotiations go to the extent you can talk about those. Uh, so over to you, Ashish. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Prashant. And thanks, Sudanva, for organizing the session. So uh, WTO is essentially the body which was formed from the GATT times, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Uh, GATT as a global trade consortium was uh, an outcome of the post-World War II era when the, Bre the Bretton Woods Institutes were formed like World Bank, IMF, and the GATT was like the third pillar of that, uh, focusing on the tariff re reduction and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, promoting uh, not, not, not like borderless trade, but easy movement of uh, goods. So GATT uh, formed in 1948. We, India was a signatory form, uh, a formative me member of GATT. And when it transitioned to WTO, uh, which came into being in uh, 1995, again, India has been a member of WTO since the very first day of the inception. So WTO, uh, WTO to, uh, today has 164 members. Uh, European Union, the, the 27 countries of the EU have got dual membership. So the EU is a member in itself, and then each of the 27 countries are also members. So 164 includes uh, all those countries plus EU as well as a single member. Uh, the focus on the, the difference between WTO and GATT was that GATT was largely around goods trade, and it was less focused on, let's say, the the trade monitoring and the dispute aspect of it. There was more around the actual rule making. Uh, the, the WTO agreements also focus on services, on intellectual property. Uh, and also uh, the function of WTO is not just to have uh, to make trade easy, which is of course one of the pillars, but it also looks at the development aspect of trade, the monitoring aspect of trade and the, uh, the dispute settlement aspect. So this is the only international body in a way which has got, got uh, I mean, if you were to compare it to a national parliamentary system, so it makes laws, it implements laws, it monitors the progress and it also solves the, it also has a judicial function involved in it, which is to essentially to, uh, to, to adjudicate uh, any disputes between uh, different members. So uh, another feature of WTO is that when the agreements were signed in 1990, I mean, the agreements were signed after a fairly long discussion of eight years, which was called the Uruguay round discussions. And the agreement was signed in Marrakesh. So it's called the Marrakesh agreement, uh, which was, so, so there were like several different documents, which are, which were negotiated over a period of eight years between 1986 and 1994, which was the Uruguay round. And this, uh, uh, I mean, these agreements, as I said, relate to goods, services, intellectual property and dispute uh, settlement as a function. Now, uh, this, these are internationally binding documents. So when you, uh, 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 when you, uh, 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 when you, when you enter an agreement in WTO, it is, it is like a, because it has got a dispute function built in, uh, it is like a judicial, uh, I mean, it's like a, uh, it, it's, it's, it's an obligatory function that you, uh, have to follow. Otherwise there could be judicial repercussions. 
So unlike other treaties, international treaties or other agreements, especially which happen under the aegis of UN, those are, uh, I mean, there the administration is a little different. In, in WTO, it works more like a corporate, how, how corporates would interact with each other. So countries act, I mean, members are supposed to act like how would, how the corporate uh, agreements would typically work. Also, WTO is a multilateral forum with consensus based decision making. All 164 members have to agree to something before it is uh, 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 enshrined as a, as a legal document. Uh, there is a provision to vote, but uh, no one has actually ever used voting. The reason is very clear that between countries, uh, uh, voting would build, can build potential distrust. And then the, the geopolitical aspects will get carried over into the trade domain, which countries don't necessarily want. Uh, of course, WTO was when the WTO was formed. Uh, just to you know, rev rewind a bit of a history, in in 1994, I mean 86 to 94, when the negotiations happened, this was also the peak uh, period of globalization, right? Like the world was coming together. The events of late late 80s, early 90s, 90s, uh, the world was generally opening up. So the 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 countries which were large trading powers were the ones who drove the rules of the, of the WTO. Uh, they thought of WTO as the forum which will help, uh, you know, globalize the world, which will bring countries together and uh, reduce barriers and barriers meaning not just trade barriers, but also uh, the world will come together more, more closely in, a, in, in, in social terms and in, in maybe cultural terms and so on. So WTO had a much broader vision than just trade uh, in the context of the time in which it was formed. Uh, since it was the peak of globalization, the countries also agreed to the uh, agreements or I mean, the, they signed the agreements, which perhaps have not served each member equally well. Uh, the, the interests of the members which wrote the agreements or which, which were in instrumental in, uh, uh, in, in bringing the legal expertise to the table then probably have been served more than the interest of the developing world. Uh, what we what we signed up for then is since it is legally binding, it it is it gets enshrined. Uh, it's a cast in stone. Uh, things don't change uh, in WTO, which is perhaps the downside of WTO, which is to say that things things are not as agile, and because countries have over a period of time understood that you you shouldn't agree to something very easily because it will be held against you and uh, you know for forever. The pace of agreement or negotiations is relatively slow. In fact, WTO has only signed one full agreement after 95, which is called a trade facilitation agreement, which was implemented in 2017. So uh, in the last at least three, four, five years, uh, you would have heard a lot of commentary around death of multilateralism, the irrelevance of WTO, uh, especially the, the, the big powers the big countries have had their own challenges with how WTO works, and they have seen that as uh, they've accused uh, the the the, competi the competitors of playing unfairly in the WTO context. So, so there have been all kinds of issues between different large economic powers in the last three, four, five years, uh, and hence the WTO working has been largely very slow. I mean, there's a lot of activity which happens in Geneva, but they were very few outcomes which were coming, which were, which were happening. So this ministerial, which also, by the way, okay, I'll just come to the ministerial in a bit, but the, the ministerial conference as a concept, this is supposed to happen every two or three years. Uh, this is the apex decision body of the WTO, where all the trade ministers of the members meet and they discuss and debate and agree on things to take forward. It, it sets the direction for any future discussions and so on. There's also the general council, which is the next level body where all the ambassadors uh, of each member to the WTO. So for example, all 164 members maintain a mission to the WTO. Uh, so like I work with the permanent mission of India to the World Trade Organization. Similarly, every member maintains a, a, a mission. A mission is headed by the ambassador and then there are other officials in, in, the, in the setup. So the ambassadors all meet in the general council, which you can think about as maybe the security council in the UN sense or the general assembly of UN. So you can think about in, in those terms, it's more like general assembly actually, because it's fully represented. So it's not a selection of members. It is full, full, full coverage of members, but the ministerial conference is the apex body 
Now, the last ministerial, if you if you rewind in the in history, 2013 ministerial which happened in Bali, there uh, one important decision was taken around. Uh, so so the Western world then wanted to push for the trade facilitation agreement, and uh, India had concerns on the agriculture uh, agreement which was signed in 94, which certainly has not been very kind to us to to put it mildly. So we had some issues around. Uh, the flexibilities we wanted for our public stock holding, our food security programs. So we were able to get uh, something which is called a Bali Peace Clause, which is to say that you can run the public stock holding in a certain way, a food security measures in a certain way, and you will not be challenged in WTO dispute forums for, uh, I mean, for for the conditions that you are applying to your food security programs. So that was a very important milestone for India, which I mean, and, and other developing countries. Yeah, Prashant. Actually, sorry, I didn't understand this bit. So, what was this? Uh, so, can you just explain in a in a language that we could we could we could get it? You know, what did it mean? Could, is it about storing in a certain manner? Yeah, it's like how do you run your food subsidy programs? What what do you buy? How do you buy? Uh, what what amount of subsidies are you al allowing into your agriculture sector? So, mm -hmm. even even if you, some conditions of the agreement on agriculture were breached uh, in the ninety four agreement, which was signed. Uh, the agreement was that the, the the developed countries or the exporting countries in agriculture will not raise a dispute against the developing countries, which were right. which were running the public stock holding program for a, from a food security standpoint. So right. as long as you are not exporting from your stocks uh, right. below, the, below the procurement prices and so on, you will not necessarily be taken to the dispute settlement. So we so this was one important thing which happened in Bali. In return of which the WTO members then implemented the trade facilitation agreement in 2017. Then uh, in 2015 in Nairobi, there was some another long declaration by all members, but there were not that many outcomes uh, which could be called productive. Then in 2017 in Buenos Aires, the ministerial was a washout. Uh, not not much was discussed or agreed upon, and there were several differences. Uh, in in the in the Buenos Aires ministerial. In fact, there was an agreement on fisheries which was being discussed, and fisheries because uh, there were several challenges. Uh, I mean, several big fishing countries were, uh, uh, you know, seeing a depletion of fish stocks globally. So there was an agreement in, of fisheries which was sought to be pushed in the Buenos Aires ministerial, which did not happen. So uh, Buenos Aires was not considered as a, a, a great success. Now, after that, the ministerial should have happened in 2019, 20 in that time frame, which was supposed to be in Kazakhstan, in in Nurul Sultan. But because of the pandemic, that never got scheduled. And then, uh, when the the pandemic became better, then because of the geography, I mean, Nurul Sultan couldn't have hosted a ministerial in the, because of the cold. So it couldn't happen in the later part of 2020 either. So uh, it was decided that we will do this in Geneva in 2021 November. Uh, and then, so this is called the Ministerial Conference 12 or MC 12, and MC 12 was scheduled in Geneva in 2007, uh, in uh, 2021 in uh, in November. But then the Omicron wave took Europe by a storm, and just four days before the ministerial, in fact, in several several delegations were already in Geneva when it got cancelled. So in uh, in around 25th, 26th of November, they cancelled the event. So that finally happened now. So one one uh, you know it, it it happened last week. So WTO had to do something very, let's say, bold or broad to to stay relevant because there was a lot of criticism happening that uh, you know major powers are bypassing WTO or there are a lot of FTAs going on. So the whole most favored nation based trade which happens in WTO was becoming irrelevant. The bodies itself is becoming irrelevant. So all those criticisms were there. So this ministerial was important in that backdrop. That coming out of a pandemic, and now that there's a war in Europe, uh, the food security concerns are uh, at the at the forefront. So, how do you? I mean, what would what, what can WTO do to assuage these real problems, rather than just looking at theoretical issues, or 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 talking talking theoretical things like cutting tariffs, etc., which a lot of members want. What exactly can WTO achieve? And this is why the ministerial was important. So, I'll just quickly show you the. You know the decisions which were taken in the ministerial and how they relate to us. So these are the outcomes which took place uh, uh, in MC12. The the first one was there was an outcome document. So this is like a ministerial document, a political statement. I would encourage everyone to read at least this one document. 
because this will give you the idea of what the trajectory of global trade would be in the next few years. This is the statement of intent by the ministers uh, that these are the topics to be covered going forward. And although not, nothing really, I mean, you, you may think that, okay, this topic doesn't impact my business immediately, but over a period of time, the rules which will then, which, which come in or, or the discussions which come in around those topics covered in the outcome document uh, will impact uh, every business, big or small. So this is the outcome document to be read. It's just a 14 paragraph Ashish, document. Is it yeah. possible to just uh, zoom in or expand it a bit so that the font is a bit bigger? We can see it for sure, but just a bit more. Yeah, that's you good enough. You can zoom it on uh, Webex, Prashant. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. I think I've, I've done that. So I'm, I'm not going through each document because each document will have a fairly, like it will be a long document, but outcome document essentially is a, is something which I would certainly encourage all of you to read uh, at leisure. It's just a three, four page document. Uh, the, this document also talks about WTO reform because there have been some concerns by developing countries like India and others that WTO doesn't do enough work to take into account the concerns of the developing countries. When you want policy space for industrialization, when you want, uh, let's say the, the dispute settlement to work properly, when you want to reduce the non-tariff barriers, when, when you face non-tariff barriers in, in, in developed countries. So one, one, I mean, those of who, who, you have, who have worked in the global trading system would know that the, the developed countries may have low tariff, but they have a lot of non-tariff barriers in terms of standards and, uh, you know, the other rules and regulations like sanitary measures and phytosanitary measures technical barriers to trade, you know, so what are collectively known as non-tariff barriers. So some of these concerns, how do we better reflect in the WTO agreements? What special carve outs should be given to developing countries to follow rules? So that, so the reform part will discuss that. And again, uh, India had a key role to play in the formulation of that language uh, of how the reform part should work. So we will also play a key role going forward in driving the reform process of WTO. So this will be a major outcome of this ministerial that in the next two, three years, uh, perhaps uh, by the time the next ministerial happens, there'll be a lot of work done on the future state of WTO. Like what should it focus on? What concerns should it take into account and all of that? Uh, then there was a uh, emergency response package, which was focused on food insecurity, world food program. Uh, I'll come to the pandemic part later, but the food crisis, which is currently going on. So there, are, there, there was a declaration. So, so, so WTO outcomes are of three types. There could be a declaration there's a decision and there's an agreement so declaration is a political uh, statement where ministers say that we will follow something we agree to do something in a in a certain way so it's it's like there's no there's no commitment being made there but it's a general political uh, statement of intent so you are supposed to broadly follow it in the way you are you can follow in your national circumstances then there is an agreement which is essentially sorry there's a decision where uh, let's say some rules continue or or discontinue. Uh, so so it's like a decision being made, and then there there are formal agreements, which is we had one formal agreement on fisheries. So I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, so in in the in the declarations on food, uh, the the members agreed that the World Food Program will be allowed to, uh, uh, you know, procure for their requirements. They do good job of helping countries which are in distress. So. Uh, uh, the, 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 so no, no country will, uh, will will impose a restriction on exports for World Food Program related procurement. Of course, there'll be uh, national circumstances to be taken into account. So if if a member has a problem itself, then you know uh, it will give it its own food security the higher priority over the WP the, the, the WFP procurement for other countries. But there was this one declaration. Uh, there was also a declaration on food insecurity around how members will help each other and so on. Then there was a one major uh, 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 declaration on the pandemic response. So WTO was seen as one of the bodies which has not done enough for pandemic response. Uh, in fact, the the uh, like if you look at the other international organizations, they made things easier during pandemic. They said that okay, like like look at India's own circumstances, right? So we said that the the government said that you can file your tax returns late, you can uh, you have exemptions from certain things, you you. The, the, the process become much more digital and so on. While what happened in WTO was that the member obligations did not reduce. In fact, the members were encouraged to do, do even more notifications or communicate even more information to WTO, which was found very cumbersome during the pandemic period. So how should WTO respond to 
this pandemic and future pandemics also. So there was a declaration on this where the members agreed to do certain things. Should we encounter yet another pandemic uh, in the future? Related to this was the decision on the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights or the TRIPS waiver, uh, especially in Pune, this could be quite relevant. Uh, this the, the TRIPS waiver, which said that the uh, any, any member can use uh, patented vaccines. Uh, I mean, it can it can it can uh, ask its own companies to make those vaccines without the uh, without a formal, let's say, agreement with a patent holder. So there's a some there's some process. For example, if someone in Pune wants to make the Pfizer vaccine, there'll be a process for that. But the government can enter into that process and allow the manufacturer in Pune to make that vaccine. Uh, this may get extended to also to, to therapeutics and to diagnostics. Uh, later on after six months, uh, but right now it is only for vaccines. Uh, this initiative was taken by India and South Africa in October 2020. So if you followed the news of vaccines, you would know that we had asked for the strips waiver in, in 2020, which took two years or let's, let's say 15, uh, 16, 18 months to negotiate. Uh, I mean, there has been one criticism that the pandemic is mostly over. But again, maybe maybe not for India, but maybe in African countries, this could be still relevant. There are still countries which have not been vaccinated enough, so they may still want to use their flexibilities which have come in under the TRIPS waiver. Uh, in fact, India, I mean, in, in October 2020, we did not have a vaccine, but now we not only have homegrown vaccines, we also have our own therapeutic and diagnostic kits. So we may become an IP giver rather than an IP taker in that sense. In fact, like Pune companies itself had, I mean, one of the companies in Pune itself was one of the first companies to make a diagnostic kit uh, for, for COVID-19. So all those questions will come into play. So how do you balance the rights of the R&D organizations and, 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 and private sector, the, the companies which are investing in R&D versus the global good? So, so this agreement tries to balance those two aspects. And as I said, fairly relevant for the Pune industry given the pharmaceutical uh, 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 footprint, which is there in Pune. Uh, then there was a decision on the e-commerce moratorium and work program. Now this is a slightly complex topic because uh, there's a history to this topic. Uh, in 1998, uh, WTO decided that members will not impose customs duties on electronic transmission. Uh, so as we know that customs duties are typically imposed on goods, right? So uh, I mean they are not imposed on services per se; they were they use on goods. Now, what is a good? The, the, the definition of the goods itself has been changing in the world. So in 1998, when this decision was taken, there was a conceptualization of some digitizable goods like electronic books, music, movies, uh, which you could, I mean, maybe in, before the internet, you would have had to ship a physical CD or a, let's say a physical media to, to transfer that good from one person to another person. But post the, in the internet era, you could download those things. You can would also transfer the ownership of those things in, in, in several cases, depending on who the provider was and what were the conditionalities and so on. So uh, in that sense, um, since the area was evolving, members did not understand fully what can be digitized, how. So there was an agreement that there will be no duties, no customs duties imposed on these kind of on electronic transmissions. Now this, this is called a moratorium and this moratorium has extended since then till now till 2022 for, for 24 years but the problem is that during these 24 years the world has become much more complex um, so many other things have been digitized there's also a risk of let's say 3d i mean 3d printing as the technology has evolved so there's a risk that you can do a design in one country you can ship the design to another country but the actual manufacturing can happen in the country itself so the goods don't cross the border only the electronic transmissions cross the border so I can, I can, let's say, design a shoe on my, uh, on, a, on a software. I can send the design, design of the shoe from Switzerland to India and India can then manufacture the shoe. Someone in India can manufacture the shoe based on the design, like uh, based on 3D printing or ad ad additive manufacturing. But the government of India cannot tax me because I did not send a shoe. I, I essentially sent a software program, right? And, and, and uh, of course, what is happening inside India, you cannot do a customs duty on that because customs duties are imposed at the border. So now if I were to send a shoe, physical shoe, I may have had paid some duty, 5, 10, 15, whatever the, num whatever the number is, right? Whatever the 
depending on the hs classification there will be some number some some duty that will be imposed so this could be a loss of revenue for the governments and uh, as e-commerce increases and as things get shipped from other parts of the world this is becoming a bit of a challenge so this in this ministerial india south africa and indonesia uh, large countries obvious reasons like large populations a uh, lot of shipments coming in inbound shipments happening so we tried to resolve this issue as to what is the scope of this moratorium what exactly are we imposing the moratorium on and uh, we tried to force the issue uh, finally it was agreed that we will extend it by two more years uh, by march 2024 we will make a decision on what exactly is the meaning of electronic transmission what should the moratorium cover and what should it not cover so we have been able to push the point that we need to have a scope definition of this 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 moratorium uh, on the converse side some developed countries which will get majorly impacted let's say if the moratorium was to go the e-commerce the large e-commerce the big tech companies would have got negatively impacted so they were they were pushing their governments that this moratorium has to be extended now uh, and and the developed countries were also in a way indicating i should i should, i wouldn't say threatening but they were indicating that let's say even the services exports should be covered in this so for example if software being written in pune for a bank in the in new york should also will then become subject to customs duties and our, our argument was that software is not goods software is essentially a service export so how can you i mean when you say the term customs duties uh, the custom duty applies only to goods so how can you tax services so there were some conflicting interpretations and let's say each country was trying to maximize its position and indicate to other that you will also get harmed so don't let, let the moratorium go and so on so there were some let's say 3 4 months of solid uh, you know uh, politicking and 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 uh, debates and discussions which happened but as of now the as it stands till till march 2024 the moratorium stands it will go away in march 2024 if there is no decision on the scope so we will now have to work towards a definition so that things are very clear in the digital world we also of course want to preserve india's policy space i mean of course we understand that india also is a major exporter of services but we also want to ensure that technologies like 3d manufacturing etc should not kill the small industries in india it shouldn't be that uh, you know everything starts getting shipped as as designs and then basically a, a local manufacturer is able to replicate that with the design which essentially would uh, i mean the the foreign company can open a local office and a subsidiary can ma manufacture it in india which could then impact the local manufacturers so so we don't want that to uh, hit the industry and that's this issue will be resolved with that criteria or that consideration in mind uh, finally there was a fishery subsidies agreement ashish, ashish yeah. so sorry so uh, how exactly would this be stopped i appreciate the point you're making that if the three large 3d printers come here in india let's say they are placed in pune then some of the work that our msmes are doing it could be done by those 3d yeah. printers a it would kill some of those msme industries and b also we would not have any revenue coming customs revenue coming right yeah uh, so i understand the problem so how di how did we deal with this or how do we deal with this what is it that we sign or not sign because of that so what we will what will happen is that so right now there has been no agreement uh, what we have said is okay we will maintain the status quo for some more time for two more years but within these two years we will define what exactly is a digitized good so we will say that each i mean there'll be a common definition so today i mean you know each country interprets electronic transmission in different ways us or switzerland or canada australia they were of the opinion that even the software services can be treated as a digitizable good and hence can be subjected to customs duties so they were telling india that you are an exporter of services we can tax you we can put customs duties on services so for example if uh, uh let's say a, a captive in pune for a bank in new york uh maintains its server from pune uh that would be subject to customs duties in 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 new york right so which we were contesting so uh these are the definitional issues which will, which will be resolved so we know that okay customs duties can be imposed on things which can only be 3d printed for example i mean i'm not saying it's an answer but it's a consideration so so we'll have to push for a point of view which uh, uh, which gives the right policy space to india and minimizes any damage for our industry especially the small industry thank you so last point was on the fisheries agreement so on fisheries subsidies so there's a problem that countries have been giving large subsidies to their fisher fishing uh, fishing ships 
Uh, fishing industry is a very unique industry where members have been, uh, I mean, members of the WTO have been fishing in deep seas, uh, which are of course not territorial in nature. Deep seas are global commons. So if you have a large ship, you can take it to the deep sea and high, high, high seas. And these ships are like factories. So they, they catch fish. They do everything on the ship itself. You know, the, 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 the processing of the fish, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the chemical processes required to preserve it, the packaging of it, and also the shipping of it. So, so the, the trans shipment quote unquote happens on the high seas itself for fishes. It's a bit like crude oil trade where a lot of the oil ex gets exchanged on the high seas. So, uh, several, several large countries have maintained these huge shipping vessels. And this has over a period of time resulted in several problems. So one problem is of what is called the IUU or illegal unreported or unregulated fishing, where members are fishing, doing things which they should not be doing as per the global uh, laws of seas or global laws of using common resources. The second problem is of overcapacity and overfishing, which is that because of subsidies, extra capacity has been created. This is a common problem, which we hear about steel industry or aluminum industry also. Similarly, some countries have created overcapacity in fishing industry. Multiple ships out there just trying to catch fish, which has re resulted in overfishing. So, you know, the fishing stock then ke keeps getting depleted because of that. And then there is something, there's a third problem, which is essentially some stocks have just become overfished in nature. So, so certain types of fishes have stopped to ex exist or they will become extinct very, very soon if you keep fishing. So, uh, there are these several complications in the, in the, in the fishing, fishing world. And because as, as if you go back in history, last, last decade, uh, this problem has been raised by UK against France, France against UK, uh, you know, US against China, several countries have, have had issues with, 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 with these, uh, high sea fishing. So the attempt of this agreement was to stop harmful subsidies, uh, and prevent uh, I mean, save the marine uh, ecology and also ensure ensure that like countries like, I mean, the, the coastal countries like India, where we don't, we don't have a fishing industry per se. I mean, India actually doesn't have any commercial ship, which is more than 24 meters in length. So we don't do this actually, but our fish stock also gets impacted because other, other countries would come and come into the sea areas close to India in Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. I mean, not in the territorial waters, but in the high seas. So in the future, we, we wouldn't be able to develop an industry because there'll be no fish to catch. It's like that. So we had to, I mean, members had to take a call on different types of subsidies of, and all of these problems. So the current agreement, which has happened addresses the IUU pillar, which is the illegal unreported and unregulated fishing. The other pillars will be addressed in future and there'll be another agreement which will cover the other problems in, in, in future. So this was a very important topic because this fisheries agreement has been in, under discussion since the Doha ministerial conference in 2001, uh, Doha was a very important conference and for, for 20 years, this, there was no agreement on this. So, uh, for, for, from a reputational perspective, it was very, very important that WTO actually address this. And although it's only a part agreement, it's a good step forward from India's perspective. India doesn't give a lot of fishing subsidies. Our fishing industry is a bit like agriculture industry where, uh, I mean, it's not even an industry in, a, in the, in the sense of how industry is perceived. It's the agriculture sector. It's the same thing as fishery sector where, uh, there are several small fishermen. They catch fish for subsistence or maybe to sell in their local markets, but we are not an industrial processing processor of fish per se, but in case we want to be one in, in future, we had to preserve the policy space. So our arguments were essentially to preserve the current interest, which are very minimal. Our subsidies are less than a billion dollars, which are very, very small. But also to preserve the future policy space to develop the industry, should we want to develop the industry. So, so it was a complex negotiation and as of now, as it stands, uh, all Indian points of view were taken into account. So that is a broad summary of what happened in the WTO. But what I will add is that the bigger takeaway here is not just the decisions or the agreements. The bigger takeaway is that WTO becomes more relevant than it was in the last seven, eight years, which means that they could be much more push for new negotiations and new agreements. So things which were stalled maybe 10 years ago, <clears throat> we may see some of that making a comeback in the, in the, in the years to come. Also because WTO will be reformed, uh, 
there will be an option or an opportunity to undo the some of the past problems. So definitely like agreement on agriculture is a huge past problem that everyone acknowledges. Uh, I mean, past problem for countries like India. So, so we have to kind of work towards uh, undoing some of the damage of, of that agreement. Uh, things like subsidies agreement, technical barriers to trade. Some of these things will come in under discussion. So the, what will happen is that because all these seven, eight things which happened, they will give a moral a high ground to WTO to start working again. So it's not so much. So Sudanva and I were discussing this last week. And Sudanva was saying that none of this may be very relevant for Pune, which is true, uh, barring trips waiver and maybe uh, e-commerce moratorium. It's not directly applicable, but uh, the applicability will come through what will ha start happening in future because WTO members will now push for more and more work in, in WTO. So that is the current uh, state of play. Uh, one, one positive part was that in every of these pillars, Indian point of view was very strongly represented. We negotiated very hard and ensured that all our, uh, positions were well reflected. There was of course some give and take in any negotiation. Uh, you, you climb down from some positions, you, you, you get a better deal in some other uh, area. So of course that is there, but every uh, uh, consideration which was there from a policy standpoint, not just from current interests, but also future interests, all of that were preserved. Also on two or three occasions when deals were falling apart, when other members were, let's say, playing hardball, India did a lot of reconciliatory work in terms of getting members to talk to each other and getting things back on track. So the response which we got and some of the pictures which you might have seen from Geneva in the last week, uh, are, would be a testimony to the fact that India was front and center in the, in the nego I mean, physically front and center in the negotiations, uh, in, in terms of taking initiative where minister and some of the senior officials who came from Delhi and my boss here, the ambassador to the WTO, they were all very keenly involved in the, uh, the, in, in, the, in the process of bridging gaps between different members. So that in that, in that sense, I mean, India now being a fifth largest economy, tri tri trillion economy. 11th largest exporter in the world, uh, last, I mean, based on the 2021, 22 figures. Uh, so we have a role to play and that role was very strongly underlined and, uh, reiterated through this ministerial and that can only improve from here on. So what we missed in 94, which is to influence the trade rules. We may now have a fresh opportunity to influence those rules as they are rethought of in the WTO reform, uh, bucket in the next two to three years. So that is the overall, let's say, perspective of what happened and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ashish. I think this is wonderful. Uh, and I'm glad that we have recorded it so that we can go through it uh, again. Uh, I'll start with a couple of questions, but I'll highly encourage if any one of the others have any question, they can just raise the hand, put the question in the chat, or there are not many of us here. So we can always kind of uh, also switch on your audio and speak. So Ashish, uh, just want to uh, get a couple of clarifications for my own better understanding. Uh, somewhere I'd read that uh, one of the biggest trouble challenge for WTO is the appellate authority is not working, right? So when we have two countries are kind of having trade dispute, then they cannot appeal and which means the trade dispute can't be resolved. Uh, is that one of the bigger problem? And if it is, uh, then what's happening about it? Right. No, absolutely. So. Uh... See, as I mentioned, dispute settlement was an integral part of the agreement uh, from the Marrakesh round. So it was an integral part of, the, of WTO. It was seen as a huge upgrade on GATT. GATT did not have, or GATT mechanism to resolve disputes was, let's say, not very effective. So uh, the WTO dispute settlement was a key function of this body. Now, what has happened since 2014 is that uh, three successive US administrations, bipartisan, uh, Obama, Obama administration, then Trump administration, and then now the Biden administration, they have stopped, uh, because I said all decisions happen by consensus. So they have not approved appointment of quote unquote judges or as the, the professionals, the legal professions on the appellate body. Appellate body is a three member body, uh, based in Geneva, which looks at the second tier appeal of any cases and uh, largely US had stopped the appointments to, to that body. Their concern was that the judgments quote unquote given by this body were against some of the domestic laws, which, uh, which, which they had, there were several reasons. I mean, it's probably a discussion for another day. Uh, it's more of a geopolitical discussion more than anything else, but, uh, were, that, that, that's what the primary reason was. And of course, uh, 
they have had some rethought rethinking of their position they are trying some other you know ways and means but i think most members feel that a two step legal process is a must you cannot have a one step legal process because in any democracy in any rule of law i mean you know there has to be a right for appeal uh, the second thing is that the appeal has to be in the same kind of seriousness or same kind of context in which the original dispute was being uh, adjudicated some members have said that can we have a arbitration process so the challenge with arbitration is that some members have more capacity to to, to run through an arbitration they just have more experience yeah. arbitration lawyers uh, have more capacity in some geographies relative to others so arbitration may not work for everyone so hence this debate has been going on as to how do we make the dispute settlement better one criticism was that it takes a lot of time for example if i file a case today against another member by the time the appellate authority makes a judgment and the member gets to implement the, what is whatever the award is uh, it will take 5 6 5 to 6 years so it basically the original problem goes away so what is the point of having the system so there was there were also this agility concerns which were there so there is there are some genuine criticisms but the fact is that the architecture is extremely critical uh, in in the sense wdo was designed so yes it's a it's a it's a live problem and uh, you know it's, it's something which will be discussed in wdo reforms and it will evolve from here on there is i think there is a general view that by 2024 we should get back to a fully functioning dispute settlement mechanism so let's see how it evolves from here thanks ashish i'll ask one more question but before that is there anyone else who would want to ask a question if not until then i'll ask one or two questions ashish uh, as you mentioned right we are 11th largest exporter we are fifth sixth largest uh, economy gdp by nominal gdp now by real gdp by real gdp yeah by real gdp now but is it how is it changing the whole scene and you of course you did mention and we also got to see in the media about india being uh, as a as a thought leader as well as physically right in the center of what was happening out there right we could also see it in the media uh has it substantially changed you know the india's role as one of those who would be backbenchers and would have one of those many views uh from that point to kind of like you know having a say which many wouldn't be able to ignore now absolutely so see india has always been a voice of the developing countries in wto uh wto has got several groupings so there's a grouping called g33 which is essentially uh actually there are 47 members it's just called g33 for historical reasons so uh in this for for example in this ministerial we put a paper on agriculture subsidies to be revisited so i think some of you who have followed this trade domain will know that the agriculture subsidies that india is allowed are, are extremely constraining in nature the way they are calculated i mean you of course the government gives some subsidies but what is being reported in wto by wto formula uh those formulas are very archaic like what is what what are what are deemed to be subsidies subsidies as, as a very archaic formula and uh, uh lot, lot of the developed nations grandfathered their subsidies into the original agreement so countries which were give, get, giving subsidies in 94 managed to retain that space in the agreement but the countries which were not giving any subsidies were asked to cut whatever little they were giving so mm-hmm. it's like uh you know it's a, it's a double edged problem like you both it was it's a stock problem it's also a flow problem in, yeah. in the stock you were not doing enough in the flow you were supposed to cut more yeah. so you know it was a extremely unfair agreement on on agriculture so now in in this case we presented a paper on the whole concept of agriculture subsidies public stock holding food security and 80 members supported it. It, it we first took it to g33 and then other members joined in from africa and so on so like uh, 80 members which represent uh more than half of world's population uh it 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 would tend towards two thirds actually i mean i i need to double check but certainly more than half of world's population uh uh you know supported our proposal uh and this included like all large countries including countries which uh you know there could be other differences in other forums like so the china indonesia pakistan they were all on board so all the top top populous countries of the world were on board on this proposal uh and although there was no decision on this but i'm sure that it will come up i mean given that there are a very strong coalition has been formed uh this will be an area of leadership for us in the coming times in the, in the coming years 
so yes i mean uh, there are several examples where the countries whose voice is not generally heard they expect us to take their cause they reach out formally informally they even very share very candidly their own positions their own red lines and they request us that can you help us in you know uh, positioning their text in some paragraph mm -hmm. or or their concerns in some discussion so yes there's a very regular role and it can only increase from here on prashant like given given the way we are evolving it can only increase uh, in in the years to come great ashish uh, one tiny technical point you did mention that it's about building consensus right would that mean almost everybody having the way to yes absolutely so uh, although wto rules also have provisions for voting two third majority three fourth majority like it happens in the parliamentary system but it is not used the reason is that because it's one member one vote uh, every power understands that if you start voting then you know it's it's very easy to like uh, a small country would have the same vote i mean a country let's say let's say uh, uh, the the smallest member of the, like say afghanistan is a most recent member in 2016 of course now they are not to be active but between afghanistan and us it's the same one vote for both the members so uh, you know so so us would not want to as a world power us would not want to have a voting enforced for a given uh, procedure which is a commonly accepted ways of working in wto got it so yeah i mean it's it's uh, it, it's not about economic might or the size of the economy it's just a agreed principle that in fact it's considered like a nuclear option in some ways that you start voting then basically any number of countries can come together and defeat a proposal so you don't want to go that got it. go that far correct uh ashish how many of you work there in the uh, in the permanent mission from india so currently there are eight officers uh, there is a so the ambassador to the permanent to the wto uh, he is a ias officer mr brajendra navneet he is 1999 batch tamil nadu officer uh, has worked in tamil nadu and in delhi extensively was in the pmo for several years uh, before he was appointed here and then there are seven other officers this is a very mixed mission this is a very interesting mission because uh there are ifs officers there's someone from indian railways traffic service there is okay. trade service there is economic service and then i am from the corporate sector i am like the <laughs> experimental candidate uh, you know coming from the outside world so it's a very mixed mission but it's also a very nice uh, experience to work because everyone brings a very different perspective and a very different context uh, from the past uh, past life experiences so so much 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 more easier to work with relative to a very specialized area um and and very collaborative way, uh, mission so as your friends we would want to know these two questions i'll ask them together so that you can respond to them but that's more as friends uh, one what has significantly changed as you moved from corporate life to uh, to a life of a diplomat so to say and second what is it that you're missing in uh, geneva that you would get in pune but you're not getting in geneva so i mean the second but would lots but what's top of mind So second one is second one is easier. I mean, because of the disruptions to Chitlay's courier uh, services, you know, a lot of stuff which was supposed to be available in Geneva is not as easily easily available. So oh. I'm hoping that some of the food stuff becomes, you know, <laughs> relatively easier to get in, into Switzerland. Uh, uh, and of course, you know, meeting meeting friends and having our regular conversations as we used to have in Marriott and so on. So I think that's something which is, uh, you know, a, a gap. but the first one which is a more kind of important and a more broader question so it's a very different experience it's a privilege to represent the country uh, to 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 put the country's position forward both in the multilateral forums and in the bilateral discussions which take place very routinely in geneva i mean prashant you have lived in geneva so you know that there's a constant engagement which keeps happening here in terms of uh, you know uh, countries talking and exchanging views and so on so it's a, it's a privilege to be doing that on behalf of the country uh, it's also a very different working style uh you know governments work and think very differently for good reason uh you know you cannot undo things very easily so when you when you decide something you have to be very sure that yes that is what you want to do do or say or represent so there are very formal protocols and very formal ways of working which have uh, which took some time of course for me to adjust to uh, in a, in a corporate setting you're always chasing targets you're always trying to like you know chasing numbers uh so it's easy to say what is your kpi Yeah. but in a, in a in a setting like this especially where things move slowly uh, how do you define the right kpis how do you mentally program yourself to say that okay you have succeeded or not succeeded so i think that evaluation uh, it took a bit of a time but of course great experience and as i said because it is a very mixed mission officers come from different uh, uh, you know parts right. of the government 
uh, there's a lot to learn from individuals. Like people have a very unique knowledge about different things. So I, it's been an immense learning experience for me over and beyond my work itself, which in itself is a, it's quite fulfilling, but a uh, lot to learn about the government and how things work. So, uh, I mean, on, on a personal front, it's a difficult, uh, transition, let's say a difficult adjustment, but in the, yeah. the professional front, it's immensely rewarding. <laughs> hey, great to hear I, that. Uh, if I could, I have uh, a couple of questions. Sir? Yes, yeah. not, please. So, uh, in terms of uh, the recent engagements at the ministerial, uh, you did allude to some of that and we chatted about it. Uh, the IPR um, waiver on the COVID uh, the vaccines and possibly potentially extending it to the therapeutics, which possibly yeah. also have a bearing on our business prospects. So, that is one question if you could uh, elaborate a bit on this. And also, there has been a, uh, some sort of a discussion about the formalization of the entry of the corporate sector in the negotiation or discussions at some forum of WTO. So, if you could um, discuss about it. Sure. So, on the trips, because what will happen is that after this decision, a member can ask its industry to make vaccine which is patented elsewhere. So, as long as you have the technical wherewithal and the know how to you know, take a vaccine and reverse engineer it or, 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 or basically through the accepted technological means reproduce it. You can do that, uh, under the provisions of what has been agreed upon. So, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, we don't necessarily need the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines today because India is well covered on the vaccination front, but several countries do need vaccines. And I mean, not just Pfizer, Moderna, other vaccines also. So they may want to reproduce those vaccines in, in their countries. Uh, in India's case, I mean, we do have our own IP, including in Pune, for example, like, uh, we have one mRNA vaccine coming up in Pune. There are companies in Hyderabad who have got their own vaccines. So potentially some countries can come and say that we want to make these vaccines, uh, in, in their countries. So we will be the giver of IP at this stage. Although when we started this discussion, we were the, we were, we could have potentially been a taker of IP, but now we will be a giver of IP because we have our own IP. When it gets extended to therapeutics and diagnostics, not so much the therapeutics, but certainly on diagnostics, because companies like in Pune, companies like my lab and so on had created their own diagnostic kits. So just in case the waiver does get extended, I mean, it's a, it's a question mark. We will come to know after six, six months in case that waiver is extended to, uh, diagnostics and therapeutics, potentially even more companies in India can be asked. I mean, uh, more countries can tap into those technologies without uh, direct involvement of the companies based out of Pune. So there is this, let's say it's, it's a potential market, which the companies may lose. So this is one way to look at it. Uh, but other way to look at it is that in case someone is interested, we can just collaborate. I mean, you know, why not just, uh, you know, I mean, if, if the companies are interested and if it opens a market for them, they can even agree for something with another government in terms of helping them out. So it, it depends on how, how the companies play the game. Uh, when the situation arises, it's, it's a little too premature to say, because this may become a company by company specific situation. So, so we will know in the next few months, but certainly Pune companies will have a role to play or can have a role to, role to play depending on the vision or, or the intent, which they have. On the second one, the WTO is an intergovernmental organization. There is no role for private sector or any other third party to come and negotiate. Uh, these bodies, I mean, these entities come to present sometimes their experiences on specific trade problems. Like for example, when there was a shipping crisis, so WTO had organized some seminars or webinars to understand what was going on on the shipping front. So then some of the large shipping companies were invited to talk their experiences, what their challenges were, what, how they were responding to government requests and so on. So there could be a situation where. Uh, WTO invites these members, but directly speaking, there is no role to play. Having said that, uh, much more, I mean, I have not seen this in India so much, but certainly in other countries, industry is very, very closely clued into what is happening in WTO. Um, uh, they put a lot of pressure on their governments on, on their respective governments to take certain positions and also they complain a lot. So for example, if a, you know, company X in a country, Y is facing a problem in another country Z X may tell the government of Y that you please take up this issue in WTO with the representatives of the country Z. 
this is something which we don't do enough in india there's a certainly a room of improvement uh the government i mean the department of commerce will never know what are the problems being faced unless they are told that there are these problems so i think that communication between industry government and when i say government i mean both in, in new delhi and here in geneva that can certainly improve and uh, there's a lot to learn that we can learn from other countries in in that regard but formally speaking there is no negotiation role or it's not being envisaged either at this stage so then so then we will check if there are any other questions uh if not then i'll get to the conclusion stage yes i'll get i'll give one or two concluding remarks and the last word to ashish hey ashish thank you so much i think this is wonderful uh and look we would want to keep coming back to you so that we we do one or two more of these uh, as we progress so that we build some understanding of what's happening out there in geneva we would love to come there and listen to all of this but for now we'll do digitally and that's fine thanks uh, thanks for shan for inviting uh, i think it's always nice to speak in a in a pune forum i will just say that uh, you know a lot of people ask what exactly wto does right like what is the role like how does the company get impacted by what wto is doing so the way i would say is that if you were to look at the global trade architecture you can think of wto as a chief strategy officer uh, the the chief strategy officer would never go and implement something unless it is uh, unless asked for right so Uh, in this case the board is essentially all the participating members sovereign countries uh and they are asking the 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 ceo could be you can say it's probably not a right analogy but maybe the director general is the closest to that role but the the, the organization acts like a C, cso where they are trying to create the rules and frameworks for future operations it is not a sales organization it's not a marketing organization so it's not a trade promotion organization in a classical deal making sense it can it can promote trade through rule making by 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 making easier rules by reducing technical barriers to trade by uh, reducing tariffs but it cannot help a company or a country to do something very specific it can it can act on a multilateral basis which is what is called the most favored nation principle or the mfn principle of wto so i think industry my i mean i've only been here 10 months but from whatever interactions i've had with the indian industry i see that maybe the this perception because there is no direct role like there is no direct deal making role industry doesn't think of wto enough <clears throat> but there should be more tracking of what's happening here because the topics which are being discussed will eventually come to bite the industry in good way or bad way so it's up to you how do you use it right so i think i would just leave with that thought uh, prashant hey thank you so much ashish i think uh, appreciate that and uh... I look forward to connect with you again sometime soon with all of these people. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all for attending it. Now we'll conclude the session.